Can I just ask for everyone where you are seated right now, just start to pray. Just start to pray. If you have a tongue, pray in that tongue. See, my desire this morning is for you to realize that what's being shared is for you. I almost feel that you need to take your hands and put them in front of you and not get distracted by what's going on to your left, not get distracted by what's going on to your right. You see, we might be in in an auditorium full of people, but this is you one-on-one with Jesus. And when He looks you in the eyes, oh, and I don't want you to get pulled to the left. I don't want you to get pulled to the right. I want you to hear everything that He has to say to you this morning. In the same way as today, we celebrate that the tomb is empty. He wants to celebrate that today your tomb is empty. Your prison cell is empty. Your burial chamber is empty because you are alive. And not just with signs of life that can be found, but full, abundant life that represents who He is and what He has already done. There was a lovely word that came through during worship from Eugene. We spoke about butterflies coming out of cocoons, and that's the beauty. We were chatting earlier about what Lazarus looked like when he came out of the tomb. Was he clothed? Wasn't he clothed? I was thinking if he was wearing burial clothes, they weren't expecting him to walk, so he probably hopped out of his tomb rather than walked. But when you come out of your tomb, Because the resurrected Christ is in you. It's that transformation. It's a thing of beauty, not a thing of horror. It's a, do you understand? You are his masterpiece. If he had a wallet with a photo in it, it would be yours. And he wants to display you to all principalities and powers and say, look at my beloved. Look how well he's done. Look how well she's done. She is perfect. He is perfect because he allowed me to mold him into the image of my son, Jesus. See, one of the things we like to do as a family, well, definitely my wife and I, our kids are a bit fussy when it comes to food, But (laughs) I like to smoke meat. I like to get a massive brisket. And I like to trim it and cut it and separate it. And then I smoke it on a smoker for 8, 9, 10, 12, 14, 16, sometimes 30 hours to get it filled with flavor. But one of the process in doing that is you need to trim off the fat. And while I'm trimming off the fat... Daphne hovers around me because she gathers all the fat that I trim off. And she then goes and puts it in a pan and starts to cook it. And when that smell comes up, our dogs, it doesn't matter where they are and what they are doing, they come sprinting because they know what's about to happen. And while I'm busy cutting and trimming, they're busy eating off the fat and they love it. Can I tell you that the angels in heaven are smelling that smell this morning? Because this morning you're going to allow the Holy Spirit to come with his scalpel and trim off that fat and remove that film because you're not going to get distracted. You're going to know that although you are in a public setting, this is about you and him. It's not about me. It's not about anyone else. So often um, our media team will contact us on a Monday or Tuesday after we've preached and they'll ask us, what's the title of your preach? 
And I'm telling you, it's probably the hardest question I get asked in a week because I've got no idea what the title of my preach is. I know what I wanted to share. I know what I hoped people would receive. But I wasn't thinking in terms of a title. But this morning's a bit different because I've had the title for months. And now I'm putting together the preach. So my title today is Dead Man Strutting. Like that. I like that. And I think it's just great that I get to preach on Easter because this isn't an Easter message that I prepared. This is what the last five to six months of my life looked like. I've been saying, Jesus, come with your scalpel. I've been saying, cut and trim. I've been saying, do what you need to do for me to look like you. And can I tell you, it's very unpleasant. Can I tell you that it hurts? Can I tell you that it's uncomfortable? But can I tell you that the outcome is glory? Can I tell you that the outcome is beauty? Can I tell you that the outcome is perfection? Because the one who created me in my mother's womb, who had a plan and a purpose and he wrapped my body around it, is molding me and shaping me to be who it is that I was created to be. And there's no greater glory and no greater honor. And we can stand here on Resurrection Sunday and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But the way we thank Jesus is by allowing him to cut us and mold us and shape us and form us into his son. That's how you show your love. That's how you show your honor. That's how you show your respect. So what is my desire this morning? For many of us at some point in our walk, for some of us in some areas of our life, we like to put Jesus as a genie in a bottle. We like to keep him locked away and tell him not to interfere with our lives until we're in crisis. Then when we're in crisis, we quickly want to rub the genie at the bottle and the genie must come out and fix all of our problems. My desire today is that when you leave, he's no longer the genie in your bottle. But he's your Lord of Lords, your King of Kings, the one at whose feet you cast your crowns and dive down and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And during worship, I loved seeing how Holy Spirit was moving. There were some really, really good tears being shed. But just as many tears as were being shed, I saw many, many people holding back and pulling back. Can I just say, please don't hold back and pull back. The person next to you would far rather have you howling like a banshee, rolling around on the floor in a puddle of snot, but being free than holding back because you don't want to disturb them. And if they want you to hold back because they don't want you to disturb them, then I don't know if they're the person you should be sitting next to. And may the fire of God fall on them. And may they roll around on the floor in a pile of snot howling like a banshee as he comes with that scalpel and cuts them free. <laughs> None of that was in my notes. So now we'll get to the notes. <laughs> so the title, Dead Man Strutting. 1999, there was a movie that came out called The Green Mile. It was a Stephen King movie, believe it or not. Although the storyline really is a picture of Christ, watch it again. It's actually quite amazing. But in this movie, The Green Mile, it's about um, prisoners on death row. And the prison that they're in has got this tiled walkway that the people walk along when they're on their way to be executed. And it's got green tiles. So it's called The Green Mile, right? So you walk along The Green Mile because you're about to be executed. And as you go along, the comment that people to your left and to your right would say is dead man walking. Because you're theoretically alive, but you're dead because you're on your way to die. There's no other outcome at this point other than death. And many people like in this movie would use that phrase as a taunt. And when we look at Jesus going to the cross, that's what they were saying, wasn't it? The Roman soldiers, dead man walking, dead man walking, thought he was the king, but he's nothing but a dead man walking. Hmm. You see, Easter, this is it. 
This is the tacky hits the tar time for us as, as Christians. Christmas is lacquer, but this is it. This is the moment where he died. This is the moment where he rose again. This is the moment where history was and now is. This is it. And you know what? Unlike Christmas, we can even more or less figure out the day, date, and time. Because it was linked to Jewish holidays and festivals, which are linked to the movements of the suns, moon, and stars. And you can actually do a calculation. And more or less, it looks like on Friday, the 3rd of April, 33 AD, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, because we're in the same time zone as Israel, Jesus died. Wow. And Roger preached so well last year when he said, and we would love to say that if we were there at the time and Jesus was there, we would never have let him die. Yes, we would have because he had to. So a true believer would have carried him to the cross running. Let's get there quickly. Let's not suffer. Let's get this over with, right? But the beauty lies in his resurrection. And there's such powerful scriptures and this is not the topic I'm preaching on today, but it's a really good, interesting thought, is that it says in Isaiah 52, verse 14, that not only was Jesus not recognizable, he wasn't recognizable as being a human. He was so badly beaten, so badly flogged, that not only could you not know there was Jesus, you wouldn't know what it was. Kind of like roadkill, what was that? I don't know something that was alive and now no longer, is yet in Luke 22, sorry, Luke 23, verse 46, and John 10, 17, verse 18, it says he willingly gave up his life. So even being beaten to that level and to that pulp where he couldn't be recognized as human, animal, mineral, vegetable, he had to choose to give up his life. And he chose to give up his life for, me. for you. Wow. Going back to my 80s and 90s movies, there was a movie that was called Freaky Friday. There were a lot of movies around that time that were kind of similar. People come along and they bump into each other or something happens. Then the one person's life gets transferred to the other person's life and the other person's life gets transferred to that person's life. And then they try and live each other's lives still in their original bodies. You get the gist of it? Isn't that the cross? Me? All my lies, deceit, dishonesty... All my pride, my ego, my manipulation, all my fears, my doubts, my insecurities, boom, transferred to him. And him who only did what he saw the father do, boom, into me. Wow. Wow. And you know that I can use a, a movie and make a, a bit light of it. But legally, that's what happened. And taste, just for you, it was a moment of nemo plus juris ad aliam transfere, potes quam ipse habet. It's a legal maxim that says you cannot transfer more rights than what you legally own. And in that moment, all the rights that Jesus legally owned got transferred to me. And all the rights that I legally owned got transferred to him. Me and my past, my present, my future versus Jesus who only did what he saw the Father do. Now, in the past, when I looked at that transaction, I saw it a little bit like a ring barking. Now, ring barking, I come from the Eastern Cape, and in the Eastern Cape, we have a lot of invasive trees, which they want to remove out of the system. So you only have indigenous trees. They do a lot of it here. But there's a tree down in the Eastern Cape called the Black Wattle. That's a real problem. 
So what the guys do is they literally go and they cut about a two centimeter strip around the tree in its bark. And when they do that, it's called ring barking. So the tree is legally dead. It might, for a season or two, still produce life because there's life inside of it and juices and whatever keeps a tree alive, but it's, ne but it's going to die. There, there is no plan B. You can't undo uh, a ring barking. And I used to think a lot of sanctification and justification. So Jesus coming into me, there was an inevitable outworking of me becoming Christ-like. But there isn't an inevitable outworking of me becoming Christ-like. I have to choose to accept what he has given me. And what he has given me is going to clash with what is in me. And when what he has given me clashes with what is in me, I can develop my own theology to justify that what is in me, or I can abdicate my throne as Lord of my life, and I can give it to him willingly. Are you with me so far? So I've often wondered if everything that Christ lived for was given to me in that moment, I said yes. Baptized, came out of the water, born again. Why for some of us is there no evidence? And that if we're in a court of law, they'd struggle to find that the life of Christ was in us. And I think it's because the quality of our dying is poor. See, a precondition to resurrection is death. So I cannot walk in resurrection power in areas of my life that haven't died. Until they die, they can't be resurrected. So I play this weird game of trying to, ooh, I don't like this area of my life. I'll die there, but this area I like, and I'm going to keep that. There's another movie. It's called Frankenstein. And many of us are Frankenstein Christians. We selective in the areas that we give to him and the others that we hold on to. For many people, when they go into the baptismal font, you see the hand sticking out. Maybe it's holding your wallet. Maybe it's holding your career. Maybe it's holding those relationships that yeah, they might not quite be biblical, but surely, maybe, 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 it all, all, all needs to die in order for there to be a resurrection. How do I know if there's areas in my life that haven't died yet. Now, I'm not trying to be graphic, so this isn't a graphic illustration, but I am trying to get a point across. Let's say my spirit left me now, and a doctor came and declared me legally dead. I'd, st I'd still be here, fully me. I just wouldn't be moving. I wouldn't be kicking. I wouldn't be screaming. I'd be lying rather still. I'd be a corpse. Will that corpse cheat, lie, and steal? It can't. It's dead. Would that corpse get offended and be ruled by its emotions? No. Would that corpse read emotions into WhatsApps? It's dead. Would it get angry, tired, and hopeless? It's dead. Would it feel the need to explain itself and defend itself? No, it's dead. Would it push to have a platform and a microphone so it could be heard? It's dead. Would it manipulate to get ahead? It's dead. 
Would it take the bait of internet trolls? Would it suffer from addiction? Would it be toxically positive or toxically negative? Would it be fiercely independent? Would it do too much? Would it feel the pressure to be the Mr. Fix-It in everyone's life, including its own? Would it be victim of chronic perfectionism? Would it have a need to continuously be in control? You get the point? If Jesus was sitting in front of you right now, and you remember this transfer of rights, what that you say is part of your personality, your character, your DNA, the way you were designed, would you not be able to give to him? That's where you haven't died. And Holy Spirit, highlight to everyone here this morning and everyone who might listen to this later, what in them is still not from you? Because you want to fully resurrect. You want them fully resurrected, living in the fullness of everything that your death, your blood purchased. Not only in the areas that they selectively choose to give to you. Every area. Not just areas of their life that are obviously bad, but in many cases areas of their life that they perceive to be very good. The quality of the resurrection power I walk in is determined by the quality of the death I'm willing to die. And dying to self is hard. Dying to self is unpleasant. I just ask that he kills me quickly rather than suffering and dying. But you've seen it. We walk with those limps in our walk. We walk with those areas because we haven't fully surrendered to him. Now, there's so many scriptures on this topic. Uh, I wouldn't know where to start and begin. So I really have just picked a few. But there's so many. If you want to do a study on this, just go to Romans 6. Study it from the beginning. Study it till the end. It will explain this really, really well. But Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. I think it's fairly straightforward. Eh? Matthew 16, verse 24. If you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely reject and disown your own life. Pooh. But what about my... Let it die. What about my... Let it die. There's others, Luke 9, verse 23, Galatians 5, verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Now to go back to the genie in the bottle, how many people have their own passions and desires and want to use Jesus as the secret blend of 11 herbs and spices to make those dreams and desires happen? You are not my Lord. You are not my Savior. You are my fairy dust genie who must do whatever I want you to do because it's my desire. And you wouldn't place that desire in my heart if you didn't want me to have it. Jesus molds plan, purpose, vision into our lives. Dreams and desires come from many, many places. Because I desire it does not make it from him. I trust and I pray as we become more and more Christ-like that our dreams and our desires line up more 
with his dreams and desires for us. But there's a walk we have to walk. There's a tipping point we need to get to. There's some areas where it's easier to align that than it is with others. I mean, the obvious ones. Oh, Lord, just bless me financially so that I can be a blessing to the kingdom. And have a really nice house and a holiday home and go overseas twice a year and have three, four cars. And they must be flashy so that when people see them, they say, wow, how did you get such a flashy car? Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. Come on. Can we be real? Bless me beyond measure because that's what your word says. But let my blessing look like the blessing you intend to give me, not the blessing that the broken me desires. Because the blessing that the broken me desires is going to move me further away from you, not closer to you. Let me die. John 12 verse 24, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. 2 Corinthians 5.17, 1 Peter 2.24, 1 Corinthians 5.31, I die every day. Sure. You mean it's not just a once-off event? And then I'm all fixed and good? Let's use another movie, Shrek. I'm like an onion. I've got layers. God, through his mercy, kindness, and grace, deals with me in an area. And then often he'll come back to that area later because he can now go deeper because I've grown stronger. And my relationship with him has grown stronger where I'm trusting him and more willing to embrace pain. I mean, so many people early in their walk, if you've been a pastor for a while and you've counseled people, you see it over and over and over again. People get filled with the Spirit. They get drunk as a skunk in, in worship. And then the, the, the tongue gets loose. Oh, Lord, refine me. <laughs> Let your fire burn in me. Two weeks later, Graham can have a coffee because I'm under attack by the devil. Um, Lord, refine me. Lord, do what you need to do in me so I can be free. Well, here, here, you see, help me. Have you seen that pattern? And Tace told us we can't even get away with not praying those prayers. We pray in tongues. We don't know what we're praying when we pray in tongues. We think we're praying the safe prayers. Feel me like a potato, Jesus. <laughs> Cut me to the core like you've never... Cut. So you don't have a choice. <laughs> You're going to pray those prayers to him knowingly or unknowingly. <laughs> but you're going to pray those prayers and he's going to answer you. So my desire this morning is that the Holy Spirit can begin to highlight in all of us an area or areas where we are still holding on for dear life. Even Jesus wrestled. He sweated blood. He cried out to his father saying, if there's any way you could take this away from me, please do. Right? So he's under no illusion that inviting death into areas where we've attached our identity to, inviting death into areas where we've attached pride to, inviting death is not easy and it hurts. But what does it look like on the other side of that pain? For the glory set before him. He endured the cross. For the glory set before me, I die to self. To give honor, praise, and glory to the lamb who was slain, I say, kill me. Take it away from me. 
if it is not from you. How? You need to acknowledge that you're not dead. If you think you're fully okay, then this message is over your head. But I'm trusting Holy Spirit is whispering, talking, or in some cases stabbing and kicking. Sometimes we need something spectacular to get our attention. Other times we just need a whisper. Whatever it takes. Then once we've acknowledged that the areas in our life that we haven't died to, so he can't resurrect in, we then have to acknowledge that maybe it does need to die. Oh, I'm okay. I'm 92.3% resurrected. Nobody's perfect, huh? It's amazing how many people, me included in the past, would use the excuse, I'm only human, to justify why I behaved like an animal. Eat, sleep, mate, defend. That's what animals do. If all you are driven by is eating, sleeping, mating, defending, you are an animal. A dog doesn't walk into the church, feel the presence of God and say, I'm going to stay. Its instincts are eat, sleep, mate, defend. Cold outside, warm inside, I will stay. Do you understand? We are called to a higher standard. So when we acknowledge the areas that aren't dead, then we acknowledge that we need to die. We then need to want to die. How do we do that? We obey the first and greatest commandment to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. And if I love you with everything, I give you everything everything, knowing it's very likely to hurt a lot, but trusting in your mercy, goodness, and kindness. And then what do I do? I abdicate my throne as the Lord of my own life, as the king, surrounded by others who need to serve my plans, purpose, and vision. And I take off my crown, and I dive at the feet of Jesus, And I say, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And then I heard something really interesting this week that I'm going to be meditating on for a a while. Genesis 33, verse 19 to 20, and the Lord said, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. Moses, speaking to God about God revealing his glory to Moses. God saying, yes, but I love you so much I will cover your eyes because to see my glory will kill you. What if I'm already dead? I can see your glory. I can see your glory now. I can see your glory today. I can live in your glory because I am dead. God is moving. Revival is here. Manifesting in some way, shape, and form in different places around the world and like a groundswell that is growing. And the manifestations of his glory are going to get greater and greater and greater and greater. Soul, spirit, mind, Hurry up and die, because I want to be in the fullness of his glory. You know, then you don't have to run around and bounce from event to event to event to event to have an encounter, because you'll live in an encounter 24-7. 
You won't have to chase an encounter because you bring an encounter wherever you go because you are an encounter. And how do I do this? I hurry up and die. So, Dad, it's incredible that we get to stand here on Resurrection Sunday and we get to celebrate that the tomb is empty. But let it not be lip service saying thank you that your tomb's empty, but ours are full. Any parent in this room, how do your children show thank you for a gift that you give them? By using it to its fullest. How do you know it's just lip service? Oh, thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah, I'm going to play with it every day. Yeah, yeah no, really. Oh, I can't wait tomorrow. I'm going to play with that thing. Do you love him? Allow him to kill you. And then allow him to flood you from the top of your head to the tips of your toes to the tips of your fingers with his resurrection 